Autistic people are not sexless, emotionless robots, but we do have very different ways of showing affection. So let's talk about autistic love languages. Validation and support for autistic people and their loved ones. Welcome, my friend. I'm Orion Kelly, that autistic guy. Now, are you a partner of an autistic person? Do you sometimes struggle <laughs> as a neurotypical person in a relationship with an autistic person to identify when we're actually showing love and affection. It's not uncommon for partners of autistic people to think that we struggle or simply don't even show any signs of love and affection. But I can tell you that is absolutely not true. Autistic people, neurodivergent people, simply have different love languages, different ways of showing and receiving love. So let's break them down. Problem solving can be a key issue in neurodiverse relationships. But in fact, for me personally, as an autistic person, I find identifying and seeking to solve problems my wife may be having is actually a form of love for me. It's part of my love language. In other words, Problem solving is my way of showing love and affection. Autistic people have a strong logical brain. In effect, a stronger, more developed logical part of our brain than the emotional part of our brain. So it stands to reason that we're going to see things that are right and wrong, black and white. This needs to be fixed. If there's a problem, we want to solve it. To broaden on that slightly, as autistic people, we may well be able to see identify problems before anyone else. And in addition to that, that may therefore trigger our brain to seek a solution, therefore identifying and potentially solving problems before anyone else does. This goes hand in hand with an autistic person's strong sense of justice, of right and wrong. Now for us, that seems like a strength. We see problems, we solve them. In relationships, however, that may not be the case. Turns out, I've been told that neurotypical people, as a rule, don't actually like things being pointed out, identified, picked. This is right, this is wrong, being corrected, having their problems solved for them. I know, it's bizarre. Who says a problem if you don't want a solution? I'll tell you, neurotypical people. Yep, turns out my wife sometimes likes to just share problems, share issues, just to share them. She calls them venting. It sounds completely healthy to me, and I totally dig it, and I respect it, and we've worked out a way to navigate it. But in fact, from an autistic point of view, if you are going to share problems, or issues, or there are going to be problems or issues that we identify, it's only natural that we want to, number one, identify them, and number one, that's not right, number two, <laughs> solve them. And this video isn't so much about hacks or strategies, it's more specifically about just trying to explain that our love languages are different as opposed to non-existent. What I will say in this situation is it's very easily fixed by myself or my wife, clearly more my wife, saying, Orion, oh, I'm gonna tell you a story from today. It's going to sound like a problem you need to solve, but this particular problem, I don't want you to solve it or point out what I did wrong. I don't want you to analyze it. I don't want you to in any way try to pull it apart. I just want you to listen, let me vent, and then move on. Okay, cool, no worries. I can deal with that dying inside. So bottom line, although it can come across through your autistic partner as unwanted advice, unsolicited feedback, critiques, or problem solving, or even a perceived personal attack, on you. It's none of those things. It's a genuine sign of love and affection from your autistic partner. But this next form of autistic love language may be slightly controversial in, really, that's a good thing? And it's something we like to call info dumping. Now, for those that aren't too sure what I mean by info dumping, and I think it's generally pretty self-explanatory, it's basically when an autistic person explains something, talks about something in great detail and generally for a long period of time. In other words, we are dumping, spewing out mass pieces of information. Seemingly, that never end. Info dumping. Matter of fact, I've got a load now. As an autistic person, certainly in my experience, there's not a lot of things I like to talk about. What I do like to talk about with my wife, say at the end of the day, in fact, I really love to talk about, is new things that I've learned. So they have no relevance or connection to her, 
our family usually. They're simply new pieces of information that I've picked up or learnt throughout the day. Because as autistic people, we can go on many adventures, many rabbit hole adventures, where something just pops in our mind, I've got to learn about that. And we do. We try to learn just about everything we can on the topic. And then we're excited about that. And then suddenly my wife's like, how do you know so much about this topic? Where did, how did you, I don't understand. You just, and it doesn't, it's no context to it. Info dumping really is, I promise you, a love language. It's a sign of love and affection from an autistic person. And I get it though, the experience of it. Look, I think it's clear, and I'm sure you know, as a rule, autistic people tend to only want to talk about things they're passionate about. And of course, passions can change. For example, you might have a new interest. You learn a lot of information about it that day because you're passionate about learning about it. The next day it's gone. But see, that then leads to an info dump. But the real kicker to this is autistic people, certainly me, very rarely know when we've gone on for too long or when you find this particular info dump boring. It's not something that I would be able to pick up on, understand, acknowledge. It's, well, look, I've learned something new. I'm bloody passionate about it. It's fascinating, in my opinion, and you need to hear about it. So yes, info dumping, or more appropriately in my context, long-winded rants directed at my wife when she's sitting on the couch trying to wind down is in effect my way of showing love and affection. My wife may connect with me with things she sees as more relevant to our day-to-day -day life. I connect with my wife by merely sharing with her long-winded rants that have little to no relevance to any aspect of our life, nor will they ever. And that's my way of connecting and showing love and affection for my wife. Let's talk about parallel play. This sounds strange. I get it, I'm sure you've heard about parallel play, whether you're a carer, a parent, support worker, a friend of an autistic child, or you're autistic. <laughs> you have definitely heard this term. It's very much diagnostically used. You're thinking, okay, Ryan, that's great. I get the idea of how you can be, assess a child and if they like to parallel play, as in they might be okay if brothers or sisters or friends are in the same room as them, but they prefer to be in the same room, but do their own thing, parallel play. Okay, cool, that's great, no worries, it helps kids, great. What are you talking about, Orion? We're doing relationships and love languages here. Okay, great, thanks so much for the feedback, really appreciate it. But guess what? We can confirm this is, we can, we can, it's just coming through now. Oh, okay, great. You don't grow out of autism. You're born autistic, you die autistic. So the parallel play that identified you as autistic as a child doesn't stop. In fact, as you grow older, with adults, with partners, that's not going to change or alter or go away. Wow, shock, horror, huh? As an autistic person, I thrive on alone time. I thrive on doing the things that I know will keep me regulated or bring me back to a regulated state. Just like a neurotypical person has things they like to do after a, a hard day at work or a hard day of life at nighttime. There's things they like to do to wind down, right? So autistic people do the same, but very specifically, usually alone or at least in the room with people, but doing that thing by themselves. So you can see how alone time and regulation is really parallel play as an autistic person. What do you mean, Orion? Can you just catch up? Seriously, you're getting on my last nerve. <laughs> I'm joking. What I'm trying to say is I like to do the things that regulate me, the things that I do by myself. So my alone time or my, my doing my individual activities while my wife winds down next to me on the couch. Do you see what I'm saying? My alone time, my individual activities that regulate me can actually be beneficial when I'm next to my wife. That is another difference in love language. That's not only me showing love and affection, that's me getting love and affection by being able to sit next to my wife on the couch at night, her do her thing, me do my thing, and there's no judgment. That's love. Simply being near her is enough for me. There's no need for interactions, filling gaps, just having her there. And me being able to do my thing that helps him regulate it, and her thing that helps her wind down is all I need. In fact, to take this further, forcing joint activities in neurodiverse relationships is the worst possible scenario. It has the opposite effect. I even enjoy doing my own thing in the same room as my kids as they do their own thing. Or me doing my own thing in the same room as my kids playing together. Rather than I'm gonna to go to a man cave as an autistic person 
I have my own kind of like alone time or my regulation time where I do my parallel play sitting on the couch while my boys play. And that's actually beneficial for everyone. Everyone wins. Again, that's another sign of love and affection. There's a lot of love languages I think are pretty important to the success of neurodiverse relationships. But this particular one may be one of the most important aspects of a successful neurodivergent relationship. I'm talking about physical intimacy. From the get-go, autistic people, neurodivergent people, neurotypical people all have different ways of showing love and also have different sexual preferences. Everyone has different sexual preferences. I'm specifically talking about it in a general point of view and through my own experiences, which I would class as demisexual, which is someone who needs a strong emotional bond to feel a sexual attraction for a sexual relationship, a strong emotional bond. Bottom line is neurotypical people, in, in my opinion, so we're talking in general terms, seem to have a real craving for physical intimacy, but day to day in a more touchy feely fashion. It, for example, they tend to see the love language reflected in hugs, holding hands, kiss goodbye, kiss hello, kiss, right? These types of just day to day touchy feely things. Also, in my opinion, it's not so much the same for neurodivergent people. So there's two love languages, right? You've got your neurotypical partner who likes that day-to-day -day physical stuff, touching, kissing, hugging, just the touchy-feely vibe, right? And then you've got autistic people, neurodivergent people, or let's just say me, I can't talk on your behalf, who don't have that need, okay? So it's like, this is a, this is a strange way of putting it, just stick with me, my example. Physical intimacy, none, or sex, none, no physical intimacy, no hugging, no kissing, no holding hands, to sex, then back to none. That's the spectrum of physical intimacy for me. Uh, I don't even really wanna hug and hold hands and kiss and stuff. No, that's, we're cool, uh, wanna have sex? Now importantly, this potential lack of interest in my experience for autistic people in that kind of touchy-feely way of showing love can give the neurotypical partner the wrong impression. In other words, the neurotypical partner can think, well, you used, when we first dated, you were touchy-feely, so now you must not be interested in me anymore. Now, you don't wanna hold my hand or hug me or kiss me. You just wanna have sex. T to me, that, that blows my mind, by the way. It's like, so you're saying you don't think I love you because I don't wanna hold your hand or hug you lots, right? That means I don't love you, but I still wanna have sex with you, so, so doesn't that rule? It's a very confusing situation. Anyway, this is why I'm doing this video. Physical intimacy love languages are incredibly different between neurotypical and neurodivergent people. It's a simple case of different languages. If we can accept that and understand that, it can make things so much better. Take away all that doubt that's unnecessary. You have to remember autistic people are autistic. We have sensory sensitivities. Now I know you can use the argument, oh, hang on, but when we were dating, you were all touchy-feely, and now you're not. That's called masking, mate. Okay, and also too, that, have you heard of the honeymoon phase? I don't think there's a couple on the planet that weren't more touchy-feely when they first started dating than later on. That's just how life is. I mean, you're probably not as touchy-feely as you were when you first started dating the autistic person. The longer you're in a relationship, and maybe more demands have come in, maybe now there's a family, or there's jobs, bills, right? The capacity goes down, so sensory sensitivities are higher. So the touchy-feely stuff can be really triggering and cause dysregulation. Add to that just a complete inability as an autistic person to properly read your love languages, your signals, your signs, your nonverbal cues. Just because we're not dating anymore in a relationship doesn't mean we, I suddenly have the book of rules on how to read my partner. I don't. For neurotypical people, please understand, it's not uncommon for autistic people to simply have a preference to not want to be touched, to not want to be touched by anyone, including their partner. Now, of course, that doesn't mean all the time. Of course, they're happy to be touched by their partner. But what I'm saying is as a general rule, because of all these challenges that make them autistic, that may ebb and flow. And that isn't saying we don't love you or not interested in you. That's saying we're autistic. And we're experiencing dysregulation or a heightened sensitivity. We didn't read that situation the way you needed us to read it. It's no more than that. A great example between myself and my wife with love languages. It seems like my wife likes gentle hugs. She likes gentle touch, big tight hugs, not a fan. Where I prefer deep tissue, you know, deep or hard compression type of hugs. For example, if someone you know, were to, to touch me or whatever in a light way, lightly, that would be very triggering for me. It's just, it's too much. Well, get, you know, it's like, it's like there's a spider on you, kind of, you know, my kids or my wife, just in a lovingly or just, you know, matter of fact way, like, you know, lightly touch me or something. And before I realize what's happening, I flick it off like it's a spider. Gentle touch for my wife, deep pressure for me, different love languages. And this isn't about 
Who wins and who loses? It's about understanding and balancing each other's needs in the relationship. It's the understanding and the balancing that's critical, that's crucial in navigating different love languages, especially in physical intimacy. Masking or unmasking for an autistic person, I think has become a bit of an ugly word. We're starting to demonize or stigmatize this idea that autistic people mask. I'm getting a bit agitated and over it, especially when neurotypical people start to chime in like everybody masks. That's right, okay, cool, everybody masks to some degree. The problem with this argument is we're, we're talking about everybody does things they need to do to fit in. So masking, cool. But see, for an autistic person, we are born into a world that already sees our differences from the very start and rejects them. Says, you make me feel uncomfortable. I don't like your differences. That means your differences are wrong. That means if you want my acceptance, if you want us to feel comfortable around you, you have to change and be like us. Now, that, in my opinion, from basically birth till death is a very different form of what we class as masking to what a neurotypical person may class as masking. And, 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 and to me, it's, it seems it's kind of the same statement as me going, I'm a person who uses a wheelchair and then a neurotypical person going, everyone gets tired walking upstairs. I mean, they're hard. We all use stairs in a different way. It's like, it doesn't make any sense. I don't even know if I'm making any sense. Certainly not from this video. The bottom line is, as an autistic person, you are born to mask, and it's extremely hard, especially for late diagnosed autistic adults who have masked their whole life, who have gone undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. It's extremely hard to unmask, to fully become your true authentic self. Now, a form, in my opinion, of love and affection, so another sign of autistic love language is unmasking in front of our partner, our family. Now this goes both ways. You might think, okay, I get it, because it means that people accept you. But why do we, why do I, as the neurotypical partner, have to handle dysregulated, crazy, autistic Orion? I actually would rather hang out with the more masked Orion. He's more regulated, he's, he's more subdued. You can do and say what you want to do and say. I'm talking in reality. And in reality, what you're watching now is Orion playing Orion Kelly, that autistic guy, recording a video to help people, to validate and support autistic people and their loved ones. What I'm like day to day will be very different because I can unmask in many different occasions. But when I unmask, it's not pretty. People don't wanna be around someone who makes them feel uncomfortable or who's different. Doesn't matter if it's your wife and your kids. At some point, I'm gonna trigger my son. He's gonna trigger me. We're gonna start doing echolalia, palalalia, weird voices, loud voices, gonna get dysregulated. It's all gonna to start to get catastrophized and snowball. And that's not something people wanna be around. And that's just the truth. I don't care if it's your partner or your enemy. For the most part, when you're being your true unique self, they don't wanna be around you. It just is what it is. But if you are able to be your true self, to unmask and be you in front of your partner, in front of your family, not only is that a great sign they love you and they respect you for you, but it's also you going to them, I'm being me in all my glory to show you how much I love you. I'm giving you me, the me that most people don't get, don't want granted, but don't get. You know, after a lifetime of rejection and judgment, the mere ability to actually feel comfortable, feel able to unmask with your neurotypical partner is an incredible feeling for an autistic person. And in doing so, Therefore, feeling comfortable and doing so is a clear sign of love and affection. Let's talk about gift giving. You may say gift giving, isn't that a love language for just about everyone? And I think that's right, it is. But this is a little bit different. Once again, if you're a neurotypical partner, you may say my autistic partner was way more romantic when we first started dating than they are now, or in effect, are not romantic at all anymore. And you're thinking, or oh, I'm telling you, you mean outwardly, probably. Bottom line is I might not be outwardly romantic, or as romantic as my wife wants me to be, or by the same token, as touchy-feely, as affectionate physically as my wife wants me to be. But when I give my wife a gift, even simply a card, I put my heart and soul into it. It isn't just a, to Renee, love Orion, cross, cross, circle, circle, or kiss, hug, kiss, hug, whatever it is. The, the idea you would buy a card that probably costs between five and seven dollars, and just write to the person and from the person. I'm like, seriously, get, get some toilet paper and write it on that. At least it's been recycled, it's recyclable. It doesn't make any sense. What a waste of time. That would never occur to me. I leave nothing to chance. I always try to buy very specific gifts. Gifts that I know my wife will enjoy and appreciate. 
Gifts she actually wants. Gifts she'll actually use. How do I do that? I listen. I observe. I take notes. Yeah, there's a notes in my phone. Throughout the year, if something pops up in my head that I've heard her say, I put it in there. And then I know for Christmas or birthday or Mother's Day or whatever, I've got my little list of things that I know she's mentioned. So yeah, that, 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 that seems like a lot of effort. To me, it isn't a lot of effort. It's, my, it's almost like a, a, a hack or a shortcut. Because it's like you get to their birthday time or Mother's Day or Christmas like, oh my God, what am I going to buy them? I don't need to do that. So yeah, I'm not overly romantic or touchy-feely, but this is this is the stuff I, I think is way more important. So this is my way of showing love. I also try really hard, and obviously this gets harder every birthday, every anniversary, every Mother's Day, every year that goes on. But I actually really try to be really thoughtful, really purposeful in what I write in cards to my wife. In other words, I try to actually convey feelings, emotions, things that you might want romantically or in person or physically, I try to put them down in words, in writing, in a card. Because you can read that and reread that and keep that and it's there. I really do, it's not just to and from. It might be, you know, the blank side of the card, I might feel that, not might, probably will definitely, fill that entire thing up from top to bottom of feelings about what I feel for her and her as a mum and a wife and you know, these. So I, I try to really make an effort in cards and gifts. And that's how I show love and affection. My love language is the details of the gifts specific to her and the words in the card. For even more expert tips and key strategies on how to thrive in neurodiverse relationships, why don't you go and check out my video featuring my neurotypical wife. In fact, there's two of them on navigating a neurodiverse relationship.